How you doing? Uh, good. You? Good. So, good. what gymnasium do you go to, or what school do you go to in uh, in town here? Yeah, I'm still in. Uh, not good gymnasium yet. Uh, okay. I Hogger School in Solna. Okay, in Solna. Okay. Yeah. And and how about you guys? Yeah. Uh, Where do you go to school? Okay. Uh, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm a PhD student at Stockholm University. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had a um I had two groups of gymnasium students from Stockholm in Abisko uh a week ago. And in Abisko, a lot of people don't realize but there's permafrost. So permafrost is something we hear about in Siberia. By the way, I'm Keith Larson. I'm a scientist at Umeå University. Formerly, I was a PhD student like yourself, but I went to Lund University. And um, yeah, I'm an ecologist, so I'm very much interested in how, um, how the environment, how the ecosystems, how the species, how their interactions change when the environment changes. And some of those things could be things like climate change, but it could be other things. But living in Abisko, I'm very lucky because every year, dozens of gymnasium you know, from around Sweden come up there and I get, get to meet you know, high school students and uh, even young university students come up from all over Europe. And so about a week, just about a week ago, we had um, high school students up there and I set up a research project with some of uh, the, the other researchers from Umi University a few years ago well, we have permafrost, and permafrost is in Myers, in, the, in Sweden, where in, um, in the rest of the Arctic, it tends to be kind of everywhere, at least where you have land. And so we go out there and we kind of measure the different properties of that permafrost ecosystem. And so the high school students actually get to participate in real research. And so it's really just kind of a nice way of going beyond kind of that textbook science and then trying to connect you with real environmental science. So that's what that's one of the things that I like to do. But I just thought I would share a couple of things with you before I talk a little bit more about um, the research we're doing in Abisko and some of the things happening in the Arctic. You know, I don't remember what year it was, but you know, remember when Greta first came out here? Well, right before that, she came up to Abisko because she was family friends with one of my students. And I met her and she was very quiet and she asked thoughtful questions and she and her dad and her dog mostly just kind of walked around and explored, and I didn't know anything about her, of course. And, uh, you know, I'm 53, so I'm a bit older. And uh, then I heard from one of my friends here in Stockholm that she was doing the school strike. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, you might be familiar with, especially about older people, is we tend to be very opinionated about things. And being opinionated is, is, is good, as long as you're willing to change your opinion. And so when I heard that Greta was out here doing the strike, I was just thinking, oh, that's not going to make any difference. And, you know, I just thought that nobody would listen to her. And, and, you know, maybe in some ways, you know, it hasn't made a difference in terms of like reducing carbon emissions. But in terms of the fact that you guys are here today, it has made a difference. I mean, it is mobilizing the generation that has the most to lose from climate change. I mean, my generation and older, we have the least to lose. We're going to be dead maybe before, you know, some of you even have your first, you know, major job. So I think... You know, I was so happy to be wrong that she had such a great impact. And then in recent years, I've kind of had what I call my road to Mars moment because most of us don't have that opportunity to kind of experience climate change and know that that's climate change. I mean, we can say, you know, if you live in Stockholm, you know, when was the last time people were ice skating on the lakes around here regularly? But if you talk to your grandparents, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was long ago, but maybe your grandparents did. I remember doing that when I was a kid. Okay. I was really small, and then I went ice skating on like a lake in Liljeholmen. Um, but like that one never even freezes over anymore. Yeah. Like, never. Yeah. So that's one way you can kind of connect with the change, right? Yeah. And so I think that for most of us, though, in our daily lives, connecting to these changes is very hard. But one of the first places I worked as a biologist in the U.S was a place called Greenville, California. And you may have heard about a month ago, the entire, the entire town burned down from a catastrophic wildfire. And that's just a coincidence because the year before, another part of a town that I lived in prior to coming to Sweden burned down from another catastrophic wildfire. 
So kind of my road to Mars moment are these two towns that I've lived in that have been affected by wildfires that weren't caused by climate change, but the intensity and the, the, uh, the size of those fires was absolutely affected by climate change. So now let me take you to Abisko. If you haven't been to Abisko, it's about 200 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. I manage something called the Climate Impacts Research Center for Umeå University. And so I, I think I already told you I'm an ecologist, but because I get to do a lot of science communication, and that's something I really enjoy doing, I've been challenging myself to figure out how to tell all these science stories in a way that can, can connect with people. Because I think the reality is that if I came here and gave you a bunch of facts about climate change, you could look all those things up on Wikipedia or on the internet. Would that really make any difference to you? So I think that trying to find ways of telling stories, and it will be the same for you, you know, when you start to try to connect with people in your families and your communities to make them care, you have to find the ways to connect them, make the stories, the narratives that are important for them. And so if you've been to Abisko or you know people who come to Abisko, it's a very popular place to go hiking. It's a very popular place to go skiing. The Arctic is warming about twice the global average rate. Now we talk about the average surface temperature rising by about a degree since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Well, I think the problem with the narrative about something like that is that none of us live our lives talking about averages. Like when is an average important? You know, I mean, the average grade in your class, what does that matter to you? It's about your grade in the class. If we talk about one degree or in Sweden, maybe even close to two degrees warming since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, most of us on a daily basis experience more than one to two degree temperature change in a day. So again, if we're gonna connect people and we're gonna create meaningful conversations and not conversations where we're just chasing our, our tails around, you know, in circles, you know, not stories where everything's predicated on some techno fantasy, that some billionaire who didn't pay taxes is gonna invent some technology that's gonna save us at the last moment from climate change. So I think for me, thinking about Abisko with those hikers and the skiers, what I can tell you is since the late 1980s, the cold winters have disappeared. So we're reliably, we would start to get snow at late October, early November. We still can get snow that time of year, but we also get a lot of rain. So we get snow and rain, snow and rain. This last winter, we didn't even really have cold weather until February. One of the first days I took my six-year-old skiing in Bjorkleden, I got a picture of her with a rainbow sticking out of her head in the rain, in the Arctic, in February. That's crazy. So these changes are quite dramatic. And when we think about warming, for example, most of us think of that time of year that's the warm time, the summer. But in Sweden, when we look at the temperature records collected all over the country in places like Abisko, we can see the warming is not taking place in the summer. I mean, we can have a hot day. It's the winter. So we're losing our cold winters. Yeah, I remember there used to be snow in the winter in Stockholm too. Yes, absolutely. I yeah. I mean, I was in Lund in 2010 when we had snow that winter and everybody was reminiscing about how it used to get snow every now and then 30 years ago, and they hadn't seen snow. We were ski cross country skiing on golf courses. So in Abisko, we're losing those cold winters. So it means, you know, in terms of skiing, well, that's really changing the equation for people who enjoy skiing. And in the summer, for example, uh, what we see is that the tree line, the forest is moving up the mountains. Now I realize that the tree line story is not very interesting until you start thinking about the fact that the mountains aren't growing. And you know, in Sweden, it's very popular to go on a fjell tour, to go hiking up in the mountains, you get above the tree line and you can hike in any direction. But our future is that the fjell is disappearing because if the tree line is moving up and the mountains aren't growing, that means the fjell or the alpine zone is disappearing now. Will there be 10 years or 50 years? I can't say, but at some point in the future, for anybody who has the aspiration to hike the famous Kungsleden, it will no longer be a fjell tour. It will be a tour in the forest where the only time you get above the tree line will be when you cross the high mountain passes. 
So that is the future. I can't tell you what date that will be, but we've put so much carbon in the atmosphere today that that is a certainty. Well, <laughs> the whole predication of it dipping is that we come up with a bunch of technology to take a ton of carbon out of the atmosphere. They're just relying on like, oh, we'll come up with something later. Yeah, that's right. And not only that, but, but we're going to have to do that forever. Earth going down and creating a world that was more like the world that you know we inherited from our ancestors we're gonna have to keep taking that carbon out for centuries maybe even millennia because of these feedback mechanisms on our planet Well, in, in theory, in theory, but the problem is, is the, the Earth's climate system is dynamic. And before we had put so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, there were warm periods in our time, in our history, and there were cold periods. And human beings constantly had to adapt to that. But the problem is, is that if you go back to even, for example, the, the, the medieval warming period, And there were less than a billion people on the planet. Now we're almost eight billion people, and most of the things that we consume on a daily basis don't come from where we live. So we, we fundamentally, as a human society, live differently on our planet than the way we did before. So that's the challenge for adaptation. I'm not saying that we can't adapt, adapt to it, but the thing is, a climate, by definition, is dynamic. And the only thing that we're doing right now is we're pushing it in a way that is making it unlivable for ourselves. So it's not to say that we, we can't reduce the carbon in the atmosphere. We should be doing that today, not tomorrow. I mean, think about it this way. You know, we hear about, oh, we can burn another 100 gigatons by the 2030 before we are at this catastrophic tipping point. But that's only predicated that we're going to take out hundreds and hundreds of gigatons in the future. So. Why should we be putting it there now, thinking that the future, somehow, you all will magically figure out how to do it? Yeah, like, why are, why are we just, like, gonna rely on, like, someone else is gonna fix it later, it's, it's not my problem, we're gonna, we're gonna fix that later, it's fine, it's fine. That's right, but we it's all happening right now. Later. It's already happening now. I don't know, that, those are just some of my experiences and some of my thoughts based on my work as a scientist. I mean, some of those things are my opinions, but they're, they're uh, my opinions based on the experiences I've had living and working in different places of the world, doing the science that I do. But ultimately, you know, we, we had a choice decades ago, and we've chosen business as usual. And business as usual is not... It's not an acceptable scenario for the future. Just, just curious, you're in, in Abisko, there is so much uh, helicopter skiing up there. Uh, have, you, have you ever had a lesson to them, uh, the helicopter businesses up there? Well, not, not, not directly, but I mean, for example, uh, I work with uh, some of the, there's actually, ironically, a group of uh, skiers, it's, it's, uh, and they have, uh, it's about it's about keep they have an NGO called like keep our winters Yes, I know. but I mean there's a there's a researcher in Umeå uh, named Cenk he's a Turkish researcher and he, he researches how climate change affects s snow in the ski industry and it turns out at least from his models it looks like the only places that will have reliable snow for skiing you know as decade by decade into the future in Sweden will be not around Aura or Rixconsin, it's gonna be around Kebnekaise and around Sarek, where we don't have a developed ski industry. And so that means that, you know, as the Alps become less and less of a ski destination, the people that value skiing, most likely some percentage of them will be coming to Abisko. They'll be flying. They'll be fl and they'll be flying. You know, they'll be flying to Northern Sweden, and then they'll be using helicopters to go skiing because we don't have lifts. 
That's, oh, not, that's not really helping the helping the issue by flying there. It's not really not really making things any better <laughs> for the to become a mainstream. Yeah. Everyone will nope. just uh, get split for it. So. Because I mean, you know, facts are all relative these days, and all the information that I've shared with you is on the internet. And so, what I'm hoping is to create a, a personal human contact, so that we can have these as conversations, and to start to think about how we can challenge ourselves to think differently. Because right now, I mean, I've been doing science communication around climate change for almost eight years. It doesn't feel like it's gotten much better, you know? There are strong forces uh, holding us back, shall we say? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. I understand. Yeah. But I think that, um, I mean, if you think about uh, any country that's built a, a coal-fired power plant in the last five years, you don't build those with the intention of shutting them down no, no, in a year. And it's They're going to be there for 30 now. years, right? Yeah, I know. So I think that these are the time scales that we have to be thinking about in terms of our economy. There are certain things like, for example, like getting, getting rid of cars and not replacing them with, with EV in big cities and getting EV public transportation, that's doable in a very, very short period of time. And that immediately has a big effect on energy consumption, okay? I mean, I, I met a guy when I was in, in uh, the south of Sweden a couple of years ago who was so happy because the uh, Pogatog, the local commuter train, was connected to where he lives near Landskrona, and he works in Malmo. And so because th they're so frequent, the trains, and they're comfortable and they have Wi-Fi on them, he can spend the same amount of money for a, a train pass as he would spend in fuel driving his car, but instead of driving an hour to work, working for eight hours and driving an hour back, he gets on the Pogatog, it takes almost an hour, but he works on the train. He works six hours in the office and then has that extra hour on the train, so his eight hours is that way. So it's really about rethinking about everything, how we do things, you know? I mean, it's great when you have public transportation, but if you're all standing like this, I mean, you know, obviously in a pandemic, that's not so good. But, you know, I mean, if you want people to use it, you have to make it easy. We are inherently lazy. You know, not, not everybody wakes up and climbs out of bed and puts their running shoes on. So what do we have to do? We have to make it easy for people. And, and sometimes making it easy for people means that you don't say, we're gonna make it hard for you and, and make it a punishment. I mean, if you closed every other road in Stockholm and made it a walking street and planted it with gardens, the only way you could legitimately do that is if you just massively improve the public transportation. That's the only way you could do it. You know, you can't c close down the coal mines in Germany without retraining the people that work there and revitalizing their communities before you close the coal mines. We have to put humans first. And I mean, of course, it feels bad when you care about nature and biodiversity and polar bears, but we're not going to save ourselves by worrying about polar bears. But we are not worrying about polar bears, but about Mapa people that are currently already dying. Yeah. And we in Western countries are worrying about having to walk another few meters while other people are already like drowning in their living rooms for years. Now. I agree. So it's, yeah, the point is people first have to understand that this is not about polar bears. Yeah. And then they also have to understand that it's not about Western countries, but about those countries that have not actually caused the problem, but are actually suffering from it. So well, you're right. And think about it. I mean, I hear all the time, it's like, oh, well, look what's happening in China and India. You know, they're growing so much and they, you know, all the coal power, power plants and stuff. And it's like, but, but it's such a distraction because the reality is that almost everything we buy here is made in those countries. So if we just stop buying it, it wouldn't drive that kind of change there. So we have to stop deflecting the issue and internalize it and say, you know, what's important? Because you know what? I mean, I have a smartphone and I, I had to pay almost, you know, half the price to replace the battery. But at the same time, in the mid-1970s, the U.S. put a, saddle, a spaceship called the Voyager, there were two of them, to study the outer planets. One of them is still operating outside the solar system, and you know what? It's operating on a battery. You know, nobody, no technician has gone up there and replaced the batteries every two years. It has a battery in it. Now, granted, it's, I mean, it's some kind of depleted uranium or plutonium battery, 
But the fact is, you know, Jimmy Carter, a U.S. president in the 1970s, put solar panels on the White House in the 1970s, and Ronald Reagan took them off. You know? Why did he take them off? Because it didn't fit his economic worldview. I mean, we get 23,000 terawatts of energy from the sun every year, and humans only use 18. If you look at the tree there, it's green because of something called photosynthesis. If you were to take all of the organisms on the planet that, that, that do photosynthesis to produce energy from the sun, and you average their efficiency, it's about half a percent, meaning for one unit of the sun's energy that hits the surface, it takes about and turns about half a percent of that energy. But did you know that if you go to Bauhaus here in Stockholm, you can buy a cheap solar panel that is 32 times as efficient as photosynthesis? So, you know, it's not some futuristic technology. You know, it's not some NASA technology. But it's already here now. Yes, but at the same time, if we continue thinking about growth, economic growth, but only we swap energy system to renewables, it's not going to be doable anyway because yeah, but uh, sure. there is the mindset is still yeah but still also wrong. there is the mining thing I mean we're going to ruin nature anyway because we want uh, we need it for for our renewables oh, absolutely so so for me a key is just uh, we have to change economic system <laughs> Yes. <laughs> that is so much simple. Still, we got to yes. speed run the revolution. So let's do it. Well, There's too much still. Like we got to speed run the revolution. System, like the fact that we are exploiting again MAPA countries yeah. and acting as if it's a fair system. Um, and yeah, acting like like colonialism doesn't still affect the entire world. Acting as if day. racism doesn't exist in Western countries, like in European countries anymore. Acting as if there is not a huge gap between rich and poor people and rich people are getting even more rich during the, from the system. It's <sighs> it's like like people think that they can say, well, oh, it's better than before because then everyone was dying of the plague. It's like, <laughs> it's not better. It's, it's getting worse. There's I think that the capitalism is uh, really one big problem. But I mean, the, the values that come with it and the norms and the culture, that's oh, yeah. the thing that we have to change. Yeah. Because yeah. if we don't give the people an alternative of other values and norms and culture, yeah. yes. the minds that you use them, yeah. Yeah. then we still have a problem. It's like, um, because we have um, replaced the value of like um, exchanging <laughs> things for like uh, money, because it's just easier when exchanging goods to have like one thing that is value. But using it for a long time means that you like exchange the idea of value